while the protons and neutrons all huddle together in the nucleus, hogging all the mass of the atoms, electrons are really doing most of the work. We living organisms are made of compounds, not elements, so we need to find out how atoms are assembled into molecules. Atoms are held together by bonds, and chemical reactions are the making and breaking of these bonds. So, I'll tell you how electrons work in a simple way. Remember that the universe is made of mat matter and energy. To understand how electrons work, we need to talk about energy. Uh, the definition of energy is the capacity to do work or affect change. Energy comes in a variety of forms, including chemical energy, mechanical energy. I've mentioned radioactive decay as one form. Heat and light are both forms of energy. One form of energy, which is interesting, is potential energy, but it's kind of weird because it's kind of more like an idea. Uh, it is the energy of position or structure. It, by which I mean matter, is not really do anything right, doing anything right now, but at some point it might, because it can. It has potential. A water tower stores water, but it is also storing gravitational potential energy in that water. When you take a, water, a shower and the water comes gushing out instead of just dripping slowly upon you, you are converting that gravitational potential energy into gravitational energy. Ah, doesn't that feel good? Okay, so back to electrons. Remember, these little negatively charged babies are in constant motion around the nucleus, like fan blades. The paths that the electrons follow are called orbitals, or orbital shells, kind of like the moon orbits the Earth, or the Earth orbits the sun. But unlike planetary orbits, which are two-dimensional, like a disk, Electron orbitals are three-dimensional, like a ball. Another feature of these orbitals is that they are quantized. That means that they are kind of like stair steps rather than like a ramp. You have to be on one step or the other, not in between. An electron can absorb energy and move from a lower orbital shell to a higher one, and it can release energy by collapsing from high to low. Each orbital shell can hold no more than two electrons. And once a shell is filled, the next electron goes to a different shell. Kind of like filling seats on a bus from the front to the back. The shell closest to the nucleus is the first orbital spherical orbital, or 1s. Then 2s for the second spherical orbital. Then things start getting weird as the next orbitals are the p orbitals, these dumbbell-shaped things here. Uh, these are the three p orbitals, in, which are in the three-dimensional planes, x, y, and z. Remembering that each orbital can hold two and only two electrons, if we add up the 1s and 2s orbitals, and then the p, x, y, and z orbitals, we have 10 electrons. Element number 10 is neon. Once we get past the p orbitals, orbital shapes can get downright funky. You might notice that the shape of this table looks vaguely familiar. Hmm, like maybe this table explains the shape of this table. The reason we have these weird points is because the behavior of electrons as they fill orbitals to approximate the number of protons in the nucleus. Because atoms are more stable if they have nearly the same number of protons as electrons, if not, uh, there is a big difference in the charge of the atom, and that's not good. But what's worse for an atom, oops, there's the 1s, 2s, and 3s, 2p and 3p orbitals. What is worse for an atom, though, is to have an outermost or valence electron shell that is incomplete. An atom is most stable, even with a slight charge discrepancy, so long as that valence shell is filled. And with that insight, we can now talk about chemical bonds. There are a few different ways for atoms to interact to form molecules. Within a molecule, there are covalent and ionic bonds. 
Molecules can also interact with each other through hydrogen bonds and van der Waals interactions. In a covalent bond, two atoms share a pair of electrons. This pair sharing completes the valence shell for both atoms. This is what you see in this table on the right. Four different examples of covalent bonding. In hydrogen gas, the two hydrogen atoms share one pair of electrons. Both atoms feel like they have two electrons completing the 1s orbital. In oxygen gas, two oxygen atoms are sharing not one, but two pairs or four electrons. You can do that. You can share two or even three pairs of electrons to form double or triple covalent bonds. Double and triple bonds are more difficult to break than just single bonds. Water, good old H2O, is the star of chapter three. And in water, one oxygen atom shares a pair of electrons with each of the two hydrogen atoms. And in methane, a carbon atom shares four electron pairs, each shared pair with an hydrogen atom to produce CH4. Different elements require different numbers of electrons to complete their valent shell. This means that they can form different numbers of covalent bonds. How many? That is determined by how many unpaired electrons are needed to complete that valent shell. For hydrogen, just one. For oxygen, two. Nitrogen, three. And carbon, four. This sharing is not always an equal arrangement. Some elements, like oxygen, have a very high affinity for electrons, also called electronegativity. They are greedy with the electrons and pull them more towards their nuclei. This makes for a molecule where the electrons spend more time around one atom, and that gives the atom a partial negative charge. Where there is a partial negative charge, there has to be a partial positive charge somewhere else. And we see that on the two hydrogen atoms in water. We will talk about this in some detail in chapter three. For many elements, sharing is not the best way to go. If you only have one or two electrons in your valence shell, or you only need one or two electrons instead of sharing, why not just trade them away? For sodium, remember that explosive metal? A neutral atom has just one electron in the valence shell. It would need seven more electrons to complete that shell. That is a lot of electrons to scrounge around for. Chlorine, the poison gas, really wants just one more electron to complete its valence shell. Thus begins a delicious partnership where sodium gives up an electron, making the inner shell the new and complete valence shell, and chlorine picks up an electron, making its valence shell complete. While these shells are now complete, the charges are not unequal. They are unequal. Uh, the sodium atom now has one proton, one more proton than electron, and thus has a net charge of plus one. And the chlorine atom has one more electron than proton, and therefore has a negative one charge. But this is more stable for both atoms. Being charged is usually more stable than having an incomplete valence shell. In sodium chloride table salt, the packing of the sodium and chlorine atoms leads to a regular pattern that can be seen in the box-like dry salt crystals. When protons and electrons are not equal in an atom or molecule, what you have is an ion. Positively charged ions are called cations, and negatively charged ions are anions. Now, why do we call sodium chloride table salt in the classroom and just salt at the dinner table? Because in the classroom and laboratory, salt can refer to any ionic compound. Epsom salt, for example, in the picture here, is magnesium sulfate, MgSO4, comprised of the cation, magnesium 2 plus, and the sulfate anion, SO4 2 minus. Notice that the sulfate ion is five covalently bonded atoms that have two extra electrons. 
Ionic bonds are very strong, as long as they don't get wet. A salt sculpture will dissolve in water. Most medications take advantage of this by being packaged as salts that can be on the dry shelf for a very, very long time and remain stable, only becoming active when you put them into a water-rich environment like your body. Here's another reason to make sure sodium chloride is the only salt on your table. Do not sprinkle Epsom salt on your food, people, or you're in for a wild ride. Moving on to the intermolecular bonds, uh, just because they are weaker does not mean they are unimportant. Uh, remember those polar covalent bonds with their partial charges? Uh, because atoms are not so great at sharing, there are consequences. Those partial positive and negative charges are attracted to each other as opposite charges do. This leads to a transient stickiness between these molecules. Again, chapter three will take a deep dive on this. Van der Waals interactions are the last type of bonding to mention here. Students often scratch their heads with these. Uh, van der Waals interactions are an artifact of electrons being in constant motion, even in molecules where the electron sharing is quite mutual. At times, the motion of electrons leads to areas where electron density is high and somewhere else, electron density becomes low. This can cause these temporary pockets of high and low electron density to be attracted to each other because opposites attract. In small molecules, the effects are small, but if you have large molecules with lots of atoms, the effects are more noticeable. One way to think of it is like a bus full of healthy, active children. They're on the way home from a field trip to the candy factory and are jumping around all over the bus. This may cause the bus to rock from side to side. The more children there are on the bus, the more pronounced is the rocking, and with enough rocking, uh, the bus might become attracted to the ground. Let's hope not. Uh, back to molecules. Let's say we have a large fat molecule and the electrons are bouncing around all over. Every now and then an area of low and high electron density form and these areas of high and low de electron density are going to be attracted to each other along these long chains of hydrocarbons for a short but observable while. So let's go back to this slide and the reason there's a gecko on it. Real geckos, not the advertising chill variety, are great at climbing vertical surfaces. If you ever picked one up, you'll find that their feet are not sticky or gummy or gluey or anything like that. They have on their feet some very fine sheets of cells that enable the geckos to wall climb using only van der Waals interaction. Here science has informed technology, as you can see in this news story. Spider-Man gloves, how cool is that? It would be very cool indeed. Uh, the scientific principle involved is Van der Waals interactions. So when can we expect these on the shelves? Well, this article came out in 2008 and says they could be ready within three years. Oh well. Molecules, which are collections of atoms arranged in ordered ways, are essential to life's functioning. Molecules are three-dimensional, which means the shape is an integral part of function. For example, uh, we are currently in the throes of an epidemic, and no, not that one, but the opioid addiction epidemic also. Drugs such as morphine, heroin, and the narcotic painkillers all function in a similar way. They interact with the cells of our bodies by mimicking the shape of molecules we produce called endorphins. These drugs work by attaching to the endorphin receptors and blocking them. The three-dimensional shape is integral to the process, just like a key that is three-dimensionally correct is the only way to open a lock. My final point here is about chemical reactions. 
A chemical reaction at the molecular scale is all about bonds forming, breaking, reforming. If we wanted to make water, we could take hydrogen gas and oxygen gas and provide energy to break the covalent bonds holding them together to allow a new arrangement of covalent bonds to form. It's really just much more efficient to turn on the tap if you want to obtain water. Most reactions are not unidirectional and we could use the same reaction on the previous slide to produce gaseous hydrogen and oxygen from water. The direction of a reaction depends on the concentration or the amounts of the different reagents that are involved. When chemical reactions come to equilibrium, it may appear that the reactions have stopped, but that is not the case. What is happening is that the rate of forward and reverse reactions are the same. For the reaction written on the slide, which shows hydrogen and nitrogen gases being converted to ammonia, none of the individual molecules become something else permanently. At equilibrium, the rates of becoming and unbecoming ammonia are equal. This brings us to the end of chapter two. And once again, please pause these learning objectives to see if you can do the things that I've asked for based on what I've just told you. And in the next chapter, I will return to discuss water.